All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Economic Innovation Group. I'm Catherine Lyons, Director of Policy at EIG. Uh, we'll kick off this discussion with a pre-recorded conversation between Senators Chris Murphy of Connecticut and Todd Young of Indiana, uh, moderated by EIG's President and CEO, John Latiri. Senators Murphy and Young have worked together since 2019 on bipartisan, bicameral uh, Workforce Mobility Act, which is legislation that would limit the use of non-compete agreements. Then I will turn it over to Heather Long of the Washington Post, who will moderate a live discussion with our esteemed panelists, who I will introduce following the video. Uh, a few housekeeping notes, this webinar is being recorded. We will post a recording uh, on the website shortly after this event, as well as circulate it to everyone uh, who registered for this event. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentations, please submit them using the Q&A box, um, and we will do our best to address them throughout the panel. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today. We've got two very important and exciting guests uh, to talk to us about non-compete reform. Uh, joining us today, Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut. Uh, Senator Murphy uh, serves on the Senate Health Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and Foreign Relations, among others. And Senator Todd Young from Indiana, who serves on Finance, Commerce, Science and Transportation, and the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. Senators uh, Murphy and Young, thank you so much for joining us. So it's fair to say that non-compete reform is enjoying its moment in the sun right now, as there is this uh, flurry of activity. We have state-level reforms bubbling up uh, year over year. We have a growing body of uh, economic research and evidence pointing to the importance of, of non-compete reform and the effects it has on the economy. We have FTC uh, proposed rulemaking in progress now, and we have federal legislation, uh, thanks to the two of you. Uh, but it's safe to say that you were also years ahead of the trend on this, that uh, conventional wisdom has followed the two of you and your leadership going back several years on the Workforce Mobility Act. So I wanted to start just with the context of why you both chose to get involved. And maybe Senator Young, you can start. What, what do you see as the conservative case for non-compete reform? What initially drew you into this issue? Well, I, freedom in short, uh, the, the freedom of individual Americans uh, to assess their own uh, passions uh, and skills and be able to, to apply those skills and, and energies to the highest and best use. Uh, Non-competes inhibit uh, the, the freedom to leave an employer. Uh, this has been a, a longstanding uh, challenge. It, of course, undermines the dynamism of, of uh, a given economy and, and the ability to create uh, uh, new businesses and, and uh, all the associated spillover benefits that might have. Uh, but I, I think more importantly, and, and uh, uh, certainly on the minds of most of my constituents, is we, we have a system where employers rightly have the ability, uh, a, whole, a whole lot of latitude in this country uh, to part ways with employees uh, where there's not a good fit or, or where uh, the employee is not adding value any longer. Uh, if you have a system like that, it's, it seems only fair uh, to most Americans that uh, the employees have the freedom to leave an employer at any given moment as well. Senator Murphy. Well, I agree with everything uh, Todd said. Um, you know, I think you know when you look at our economy today, um, you know what's um, you know, hurting a lot of Americans is a lack of, of of wages, able to keep up with the cost of living, and the only way to make sure our economy survives in the long run is to be an innovation focused economy. And you know, to me, I agree wholeheartedly that this is fundamentally about freedom, fundamentally about the right of workers to be able to move on to new employment or to start their own uh, company when they think the time is right. Um, but it also is an investment in wages. I mean, the, the surprising number of low income workers uh, have non-compete agreements. That seems to me to be primarily a tactic to try to keep wages low by um, depressing uh, competition for labor. Um, but we also know we need to be an innovation-based economy. We, we want to do everything possible to promote people who want to go out and start a business, who want to go out and innovate, uh, to be entrepreneurs, to do that. And often these non-compete agreements uh, prevent somebody who's got a really great idea uh, from going out and midwifing that into a new successful company. So uh, agreed, this is about first and foremost worker freedom. Um, but it is also about trying to 
you know, have a common sense, bipartisan, non-ideological policy that's going to support wages uh, and support innovation. Senator Murphy, you mentioned the bipartisanship here. Obviously, in a closely divided Congress, the fact that the Workforce Mobility Act enjoys bipartisan and bicameral support uh, is a significant thing. Senator Young, can you share why you think this has become increasingly resonant across the political spectrum, including on your side of the aisle? This sort of flexibility required in a pandemic situation uh, underscored the importance of this. Heading into the pandemic, we already had roughly one in five Americans whose uh, wages, whose innovative potential, uh, whose ability to start businesses was constrained by non-compete agreements. Uh, but uh, I increasingly heard about the importance uh, of this issue over the course of the pandemic. I also don't want to under uh, state the importance of leadership as it pertains to these issues. Senator Murphy uh, on the Democratic side has, has been a really important voice giving credibility and increasing the visibility of uh, this public policy issue. And, and fortunately, we have some excellent partners over in the House side and, and EIG and others on the outside uh, are, are really uh, amplifying the importance of this issue. But through the process of education uh, and, and, uh, and necessity uh, that is uh, eventuated from the pandemic, I, I think we're now in a position uh, to uh, move this forward, move the reforms forward. One of the things that's really helped to, to bring this to another level of awareness among the media and general public uh, building on your leadership is the FTC's recent action. Uh, they proposed uh, a rule that would be uh, very similar in effect to what the Workforce Mobility Act would, would do through legislation. You both welcomed the FTC's attention to this, but uh, you both see a role for Congress, as do we. Uh, a role for Congress to play in, in providing finality to the issue and certainty to the issue. Talk, talk to us, both of you, about why, uh, why we can't simply rely on the FTC as a panacea here, and what, what is the role of Congress vis-a-vis -vis this issue, regardless of what the FTC chooses to do? I mean, I, you know, I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy, and uh, I believe the FTC has the uh, ability and the statutory authority to step in here. I do believe that this is an unfair trade practice. Senator Young you know, referenced the fact that there is a growing public awareness of these non-compete agreements, in part because uh, you know, folks discover that they've signed one um, often after they've agreed to the terms uh, of employment, sometimes only when they're planning on leaving. Uh, do they find out that buried inside their employment agreement was uh, a restriction on their ability to leave and go uh, get another job? So many of these Clauses are not disclosed up front, and I do think there's important there's an importance behind making it permanent and not you know ultimately leaving this up to administration decision making because um, you do want to provide certainty for the economy as to the rules regarding non competes who can enter into them who can't you know we still allow for narrow exceptions in our legislation um, for non compete agreements uh, for instance between you know partners. Um, in a partnership arrangement, uh, but that certainty that comes with a statute just has benefit in the long run to the entire economy. If I could add there, it's really important that we get this, uh, we get these uh, policy reforms uh, right, and and that means having all stakeholders be able to submit comments and provide feedback in, in an open and uh, transparent process. That's what the legislative process gives you. I would imagine a number of our colleagues will want to weigh in and, and um, optimize even our proposal, and I, I would remain open to that, uh, although we've already uh, solicited quite a bit of feedback as it relates to this uh, proposal. Um, our business owners, they, they need permanency. It's our job to give them that, but also uh, to protect our workers. Uh, it is uh, you know, the federal government and, by extension, members of Congress who oversee labor law. It's also our, our constitutional mandate uh, to uh, ensure that we facilitate interstate commerce. Uh, and uh, there are a number of states that, uh, though, as you indicated, John, are making reforms in this area, uh, aligning their policies into a, a national labor market would be quite helpful to our economy as, as we uh, look to the future. Uh, I want to talk about what may be happening at the higher end of, of the, uh, the wage scale as well and some of the benefits of the more comprehensive type of reform that you all have proposed. Uh, 
taking a step back, one of the one of the trends in our economy that EIG and many other observers have been concerned about for a while is the decline of economic dynamism. So we see this in lower rates of new business formation, lower rates of IPO, uh, of patents, of all, geographic mobility and labor mobility. And all these things kind of speak to a directional trend downward from the very uh, high dynamism economy of, of the late 20th century. Uh, Senator Murphy, maybe you could start here and then Senator Young chime in. How do you see this piece of legislation factoring into that broader policy effort to, to revive American dynamism? Well, as I mentioned at the outset, I mean, I don't see any future for the American economy um, that doesn't involve restoring that dynamism and flexibility, that liquidity of ideas um, that has been our hallmark. Uh, and there's just no doubt that these non-compete agreements are used by incumbent companies to try to prevent competition from forming. And um, you know, there's statistics suggesting that you know, in places where you have sort of high enforceability of non-compete agreements, uh, new firm entry it, it can be reduced by 15, 20 percent. And then even when an individual decides to go out and start a new company, um, if they have a non-compete agreement that they may believe uh, with good reason they are not in violation of, studies show that investors um, often get very scared about making an investment when there's a possibility of an enforcement action to come on a non-compete agreement, even if there isn't a good faith case that it, uh, that it applies. For many workers, um, their non-compete agreements are actually unenforceable under state law, but the cost of contesting or the risk of having to go through litigation is what prevents them from going out and starting a new business, even if they're pretty sure that state law doesn't allow for the enforcement of their particular clause. So there are all sorts of ways that these non-compete agreements depress uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and you know, you just have to look to you know the state of California. And you know, my Republican friends may not want to model the national economy after California's economy, but there's that's just correct. That's correct. <laughs> I will submit that. I will stipulate that for the record. Uh, but there's probably no doubt that California over the years has shown you know pretty amazing dynamism. Uh, some of the most important international companies um, have. Um, been hatched in California. California is one of the few states that has a pretty strong prohibition on non-compete agreements. And so a, a state that you know, literally defines itself um, by its, hospi uh, its, its, its hospitality to, Im to innovation has decided that the way to promote innovation, the way to frankly protect intellectual property is to um, ban these non-compete agreements. That's actually a great segue for you, Senator Young, on chips and science. Well, one of the big goals of that legislation, one of the things you've really championed is this idea of regional innovation hubs and promoting a broader industrial base of innovation around the country in places that are more non-traditional, not the Silicon Valleys, but elsewhere. I think Senator Murphy's really teed up a, 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 an important theme here as to what are the lessons we can learn from the ultimate innovation hub of, of Silicon Valley and how non-competes factored into that story how do you see the linkage here between workforce mobility and that bigger goal uh, that you've been such a champion for in chips and science? Well, uh, thank you. And I, I actually agree with everything Chris said. I think it's 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 notable that uh, not only California, which is indeed an oasis of, of dynamism and and uh, innovation, at least in certain areas of, of, of California, um, it's not the only state to have benefited from uh, the limitations on, on non-competes. One thinks of, of states as diverse as North Dakota and, and Oklahoma. So all sorts of different uh, regional economies and, and state economies uh, have, have uh, benefited from uh, putting due constraints on the use of, of non-competes. And it's important that we do so as, as we try and implement this major investment in federal technology research and, and uh, development, uh, ultimately commercialization. It's gonna require quite a bit of talent uh, from the postdoctoral level down to certificates and, 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 and tradespeople. And um, uh, where, uh, where our private innovators and entrepreneurs and, and investors uh, create uh, amazing products and, and are commercializing those products, they're going to need people 
This is going to uh, require a whole of, uh, of, of, of labor market effort to make sure that uh, we continue to lead in these uh, strategic industries of the future. The last thing we want to do is, uh, with one hand, to make major taxpayer investments in our economic security and national security, but on the other hand, starve starve uh, these uh, innovation engines of the requisite talent to make this investment actually uh, bear the fruit uh, that uh, all of us have promised. So non-competes, of course, will lead to a more fit, efficient allocation of labor and ensure that the Chips and Science Act and other similar measures in the future uh, meet with success. I think that's a really important point. And, and again, I, I see this bill as being as addressing one of those core ingredients that we know are essential to the success of any knowledge economy innovation hub type of type of area around the country, uh, and again we have we have the proven examples to look to, so we don't have to guess as to why those those examples are so important. I want to turn to one of the things we often hear used in defense of the status quo on non competes, and that's from the employer side that uh, there's legitimate business interests to protect, that there are uh, there are things for which non competes provide. Uh, a broad prohibition on sharing of trade secrets or confidential information or client lists or things like that, that uh, we can understand any, any business is going to want to protect as much as they can from competition. Uh, and yet, when we look at some of the evidence, including very recently emerging evidence from Washington State, for example, where they enacted a ban that went all the way up to 100,000 uh, in income for, uh, per worker. Um, so anyone below that was exempted from non-competes. They didn't find the evidence that employers were actually pricing in uh, the value of non-competes by raising those workers who are just below the line, above the line, so they could cover them. Uh, in other words, it, it really tackles one of those fundamental uh, uh, pro-non-compete stories that we, we often hear. But I think what's often lost is what other tools employers have. And, and uh, I think one can both be in agreement, as I think both of you are, but I don't want to speak for you, on the, the, the legitimacy of protecting certain types of business interests while also not using the blunt instrument of non-competes to do so. So Senator Murphy, maybe you first could speak to what, what you see as the reconciliation between those two ideas. What are the other tools that employers have at their disposal uh, that, that make non-competes less necessary, less relevant? There's a whole body of law uh, that protects intellectual property and trade secrets. And there is not a whole lot of evidence that that set of law is not adequate in order to protect a company against a former employee stealing um, a, a, a patent or a copyright or a trade secret and using it for their benefit. Um, to, to think that the way you prevent trade secrets or the theft of intellectual property is to ban entrepreneurship or to greatly restrict entrepreneurship I think it belies the way that America has sort of treated problems that we have faced over the course of our history. And so that's what we're, we think we can do here. Obviously, California, you know, we come back to it over and over again. Plenty of states have figured out a way to allow for entrepreneurship through the non-enforceability of non-competes and protect intellectual property and trade secrets. And we think that we can learn from that experience on a national basis. John. Uh, th there are several legal instruments available to uh, employers to deal with the concern that the vast majority of employers have uh, when we begin the conversation about narrowing uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, appropriate circumstances where, where non-competes can be used. Non-solicitation agreements are available uh, to employers to uh, enforce uh, if necessary. Non-disclosure agreements a whole body of, of trade secrets law. Um, so there, there are a number of, of existing legal instruments. Non-compete agreements are really, and, and this is a term that attorneys use quite a bit, they are overbroad, that is too sweeping in their application and over-inclusive. They include too many different groups that uh, shouldn't be scooped up uh, into non-compete agreements. And when you sit down with employers, most of uh, whom blessedly are not attorneys, and you explain this, uh, they become much more receptive to often embracing non-compete reform and recognizing uh, that they will benefit uh, from the ability to compete for other firms, uh, workers, uh, and they'll also benefit from the uh, broader economic growth associated with uh, the curtailment of, 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 of their use. 
you've been very generous with your time. I want to close because uh, on, on, a, on a theme that I think will be particularly relevant to our audience. Many folks who are listening to this conversation want, uh, want to be involved, want to be helpful to you uh, in advancing the Workforce Mobility Act. And so maybe you can weekend end with maybe a, a quick sense of how you see the process playing out this year. What are the opportunities to advance this legislation? And what's your wish list from folks who want to get involved, organizations, stakeholders, businesses, folks who believe in, uh, in this issue? Uh, what would you have them do to be helpful to that process? Well, I mean, this is um, you know already a, a you know kind of unlikely bipartisan consensus. Um, you know, Senator Kramer and Kane and Young and I was probably the one piece of legislation that the four of us will all introduce together, and uh, we want to continue to grow that bipartisan support, and we will um, do that work inside the Senate. Nothing can pass the Senate like this unless you've got support on both sides of the aisle. Um, one of the things that would just be personally helpful to me is for you know people out there who have had you know experiences with non-competes um, to you know bring them forward. I know you know sometimes people are uncomfortable talking about that experience. There are some people that are you know currently engaged in litigation or fear litigation. So I know all the reasons why um, you know that sometimes can be um, uh, you know can come with a downside. But um, I, I think it's important for 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 Americans and for our colleagues to understand what the practical implications, both for low-income workers and for high-income workers uh, of uh, non-compete in enforcement. So that's you know, just one idea for, for people uh, that would certainly at least help me. Senator Young? I think uh, Senator Murphy's uh, suggestion is, is, is one that could be quite powerful. I've heard uh, many examples of healthcare workers over the course of a, a, a pandemic that uh, have been constrained by non-competes. Those, of course, are powerful, but uh, I sus suspect we're just touching the surface. Um, advocate uh, to your members of Congress that they take this issue uh, seriously, that they uh, learn about uh, our reform effort. And uh, uh, if, uh, if, if our viewers feel, feel strongly enough about the solution we put forward, as, as I, I think many will when they familiarize themselves with it, uh, advocate that uh, their member of Congress, their U.S. Senator, co-sponsors this effort. That's great. We'll end it there. Thank you so much to both of you, both for your time today and for your leadership on this issue. You've truly uh, blazed a path here for others to follow. Uh, and uh, it's great to see so much attention now being paid uh, to that great work. So thanks again. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. All right. Well, thank you again to Senators Murphy and Young uh, for participating and to their staffs for helping to facilitate that conversation. Uh, I want to now introduce the, our panelists for the second part of this webinar, uh, which we will be moderated by Heather Long, columnist and editorial board member of the Washington Post. We are joined today by Evan Starr, professor at the University of Maryland, Peter Gassner, CEO of Viva, Viva Systems, um, and Steve Cox, president of Steam and Logistics. Heather, over to you. Thanks very much, and thanks to the Economic Innovation Group for hosting this today. Um, Evan, I want to start with you. You've been researching non-compete agreements for years in different states and uh, different companies, and I'm wondering if you could say, just give us the big picture context, roughly how many workers in the United States are currently subject to these agreements, and as you continue to do your research, what, what still shocks you today about how these agreements are used? Thanks so much, Heather, and to the folks at EIG uh, for having me. <clears throat> so about 30% of firms use non-compete agreements with all of their workers. Uh, that includes the top executives all the way down to uh, the low paid workers and potentially even the volunteer interns. And so when you try to convert that to the number of workers, uh, the estimates vary, but what you'll find is between 18% and 28% uh, of workers in the US are bound by a non-compete agreement. Approximately 40% say they've been bound by one at some point in time. And so if you convert that into the actual number of workers, we're talking about around 30 million workers, potentially more. Um, and I, you know, I've been doing this research now for about a decade. And I think um, the things that, that surprise me are that we tend to think of workers who make a lot of money uh, as sophisticated. But even just today, I was having a conversation with a, an MBA student who is highly paid and, uh, and this particular student uh, is trying to change firms. She is unhappy in her current place. She didn't know about her non-compete agreement. And what she has is a worldwide non-compete that could last uh, two years. 
And so uh, she's just feeling stuck and uh, is in a specialized position and, um, and doesn't want to leave the industry for two years. And so uh, I just, uh, we tend to think that sophisticated, smart individuals know what they're getting into. And I think uh, by and large, uh, most individuals just sign these things on day one because they want the job. And, um, and you know, the, the, the hardship that they face ex post is really, is really hard for them to, to grapple with. Steve, I wanna to turn to you next. Uh, you're obviously leading a company. You're leading a company in Tennessee, very fast growing part of the co country. You're in logistics, so not the tech specter we've spent a lot of time talking about so far on the webinar. Um, can you tell us why in your company did you decide not to do these agreements? Yeah, thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me. Uh, you know, we just don't believe in uh, just kind of ideologically uh, the fact of having someone come in and uh, work for our company. We just don't think it's very fair uh, to people that we would hire. And, and you know, why, why would we say you can't work for anyone else if STEAM doesn't work out for you? And, and I mean, you could be laid off, you could be fired. Uh, and, and, you know, there might be reasons that are beyond your control that you had to leave a company uh, or, or us in, in this case. Uh, and that's just not, that we just don't believe in that. And let me follow up. I'm curious if, if you were ever subject to one of these agreements in your career. And also, as you talk to other business executives, particularly in your industry, in your part of the country, uh, how do you convince others to, to follow your lead or, or that these are no longer necessary? What arguments seem to resonate well? Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of great arguments. I've, I've personally never been subject to one, uh, fortunately, uh, when it comes to employment. But, you know, two really cool arguments for us. One, uh, just steam logistics in general. So we uh, did 33 million in sales in 2019. We did 765 million in sales last year. So in three years, uh, we have grown exponentially without a non-compete. Uh, and, and so, and, and, the, and the senators in their discussion uh, you know, they kind of grab my second point. It's not necessary. Uh, we uh, feel that we protect ourselves with non-solicit agreements that we have our people sign. Uh, so we just don't think it's necessary at all. And, and, and we have the results to really prove that over the past three years. And, and that's why we really take a stance uh, against the non-competes. And can you just say briefly, I, I assume most people watching this know what a non-solicit agreement is, but can you just say briefly what that other alternative you use is? Yeah, for us, it just covers uh, an ex-employee taking their customers uh, or the customers that they worked on while they're at Steam Logistics uh, and their coworkers uh, that they worked with at Steam Logistics. And that that would be the only two things we'd really be concerned about uh, uh, when it comes to that. So that's what our non-solicit agreements cover. Got it. Uh, Peter, I want to turn to you. You know, you're in the fast growing cloud computing business out in California. A state that's gotten a lot of attention in this non-compete discussion since it is one of the three states that mostly bans non-competes. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, you often make this argument similar to what we were hearing at the end of the discussion with the senators that it it does it, these bans on non-compete shouldn't just be for the entry level or the lower income workers. You know, a lot of people agree it's crazy that someone who makes a hamburger at a fast food place or a sandwich shouldn't be forced to sign a non-compete, but you often hear, as you know better than me, and particularly in tech circles, that all these intellectual property and, and these tech companies, that, that there's more of a reason for it from higher earning uh, executives and engineers. So I'm wondering why you decided to ban non-competes in your company, and if you could say more broadly what you see in the tech space. Yeah, I think it, you know, just just like with Steve, it starts with the philosophy and you know, based on freedom and fairness, right? The individual, you have to respect the individual, respect their their future, right? And you you I think uh it has to go two ways. When a company is paying an individual, uh the company has a claim on that individual's time and, and deserves to get their best work. But after you're no longer paying the individual, they should be free. It's just it's just not okay. So it stemmed out of that for me, just sort of, it for me personally, it failed the do the right thing test. It, it's just not right. Now, then why, you know, for all workers, because all, all people are humans, right? They all should be treated fairly. You can't make an arbitrary uh, distinction there. And then there's a real, real strong economic case for, 
executives being able to freely move between companies and that's to business creation and idea creation fundamentally if you even look at the word non-compete agreement everybody would just realize that's to stifle competition now that's that may be good for an individual company in some cases but it's not good for the ec economics of the society overall right it's stifling um, competition so um, to me it's just pretty clear now also i don't i don't view it as risky as all at all because california has been operating under this system for for decades and uh you won't find anybody in california and saying hey we want to bring back non-compete agreements or you know we need them to protect our economic dy dynamism um so it, it just fails the common sense test to me mm. And can you say a little bit, do you use other types of agreements like what Steve was mentioning with, with non-solicit to protect any specific interests you're worried about? We have confidentiality, confidentiality agreements uh, with our employees so that they don't disclose our confidential information. That's the main thing. We also have non-solicit agreements so that our employees wouldn't solicit their coworkers to join them. It's it's fine if their coworkers on their on their own behalf move companies to join them, but it shouldn't be using their information, their their contact list to, and that's for a, a, a period of about a year. So we we believe that's. Uh, fair and reasonable judgment. Yeah, that makes some sense. Uh, I, I want to ask about the legislation and about the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission has proposed um, banning all non-competes across the country. That's They just had a big comment submission period for this, and I think everyone's waiting to see if there'll be a final rule and what that will look like. Um, Steve, I'm, I'm curious your take on this idea. Do of doing it for all workers versus say for lower income or uh, entry level workers is there a reason in your mind that it really needs to be all workers yeah i think i think a lot of times when you start trying to figure out exceptions it, it makes it very complicated right and and uh I, I i agree with everyone else on the panel there's no reason uh, to limit anyone's uh, mobility at all and and in the end the only thing that they're used for is uh, to really bully former employees into not working for another company or staying in their seat, uh, whether they're happy or not with the current company. And, and again, they're just, the only thing they're good for is to limit competition. So yeah, a complete ban, uh, I think would be very appropriate. Evan, I want to ask you about this one too. Uh, in, in particular, as many people who are watching may know, there's three states at the moment that currently, we've been talking about California, but also North Dakota and Oklahoma that pretty much ban all of these agreements. Um, but I believe it's 13 states in the District of Columbia um, that do it partially. And you in particular, you and I have talked about the state of Washington, which sets that threshold roughly around 100,000. It's, it's indexed to inflation. So any worker earning less than about six figures wouldn't be subject to it. Um, what, have, what have you learned as you look at states like Washington that may apply to this debate that's going on about where to set this threshold at the national level? Yeah, thanks so much, Heather. You know, so over the last six years, states have taken uh, just wildly different approaches to regulated non-competes. You know, uh, a lot of them have banned them for low-wage workers. Uh, the lowest was Illinois, which was at $13 an hour back in 2017. They've since raised that to about 75000 Maryland, I think, is now among the lowest at $15 an hour, and New Hampshire at $14.50 an hour. And then you get all the way up to now D.C. at $150,000. So states are really just like figuring out what is low wage, you know, and, and they've taken very different uh, approaches. What we wanted to know in, the, in this Washington case is that we thought these wage thresholds set up a really interesting natural experiment, which could hopefully reveal the extent to which firms value non-compete agreements. And the way that we can do that is by thinking about a worker in Washington who's making $99,000. Now, the Washington law came into effect in 2020, and it was retroactive. So if you take a worker who is making $99,000 in 2019, the firm could have potentially enforced that worker's non-compete agreement. They would have had to satisfy the typical criteria in Washington, which was similar to most other states. But in 2020, that worker's non-compete would have been unenforceable, per se, because they were underneath the statutory threshold of $100,000. And so our idea is that the firm doesn't necessarily have to abide by that. In fact, all they have to do is just give the worker a thousand extra dollars in their end of year bonus to get them over that threshold. Just pay them a little bit more to get to that $100,000 threshold. 
And, and so it's like, a, it's like a voluntary minimum wage, right? When would you pay a voluntary minimum wage? When you, the benefit that you get exceeds the cost of getting there. And so that was, that's the test. The test is do firms pay workers just to get them to $100,000 so that they have a chance of enforcing their non-competes. And we have data covering the near universe of workers in Washington. And it, whatever industry you're in, it doesn't matter if you're in retail trade or professional technical services or manufacturing, we find no evidence that firms are giving workers raises to get them above these thresholds to potentially enforce their non-compete agreements. And so we, we, we trying to figure out what's going on. So we surveyed uh, attorneys in Washington and they also told us that they expect very few firms to, to give workers raises. And they said it's because firms rarely have to go to court to enforce these things and because firms have other tools, very much similar to what Steve and, and Peter just said. And so our interpretation of all that evidence is that firms don't really care about their ability to enforce non-competes for workers at $100,000 in Washington. That's about the 80th percentile of the earnings distribution. It's possible that firms would care at the 90th percentile or the 95th, we don't know where, but it's not at the 80th percentile. And so our sense is that if you're gonna debate non-compete agreements, they should probably be just the top income earners that we're really focusing on. And do you take a stance on whether it should be a national ban or for, for all the way to the top? <clears throat> well, so I'm a researcher first and foremost, and I try to find where there's disagreement and figure out where I can find evidence to push us on one side or the other. But other researchers have been working on this question. And uh, there's a recent paper by Leon Chi, which, which suggests that even for executives that non-compete agreements are inefficient and that a ban is close to optimal. The same thing is true in a recent paper uh, by Salome, uh, Salome Baz Lanze, who finds that just on innovation grounds alone, that a ban is an optimal policy. And so wow. I'll, I'll let those papers speak for themselves. Yeah. Um, Peter, I want to turn to you, back to you. Um, you operate globally and have experienced hiring people in many countries around the world. And I'm curious if you could give us a little bit of that global perspective. What do you see in this area and other countries that uh, people in the US, and I know we, we sometimes think we're always the best and we do everything the right way here, but can you give us some insights from what you've learned and your experience elsewhere? Yeah, on this, so we have employed over 40% of our employees are, are outside the US. And I can tell you that the U.S. is the most problematic country of all the countries that we operate in. We operate in more than 40 countries. It's the most problematic. Uh, other countries just, they don't subscribe to this philosophy that you can limit somebody's future while not paying them. And now each country is going to have its own different scheme, but oftentimes they'll say the country law will be, well, you can limit competition if you continue to pay that employ their full salary. And therefore, there's a natural moderation because companies don't want to pay that full salary for a year, you know, when a person leaves. So that's how it's normally handled. Um, but I tell you, the best system of all, of all is the most clearest, and that's the California system. The reason why I'm so enthusiastic about government action be it Congress or, or FTC, is because that levels the playing field for all companies and, and across all states. And I think you would see companies no longer complain about this issue at all because they'd all be on the same level playing field. But it's hard for it to go from the grass, from, from the ground up, because each, each company is a little bit worried, especially the older companies, they might be a little bit worried of giving up some advantage that they think they have. But a government action, and it'd be done, and there just wouldn't be complaining, and we'd move on. Huh, that's really interesting, what you're seeing across the globe. Um, fascinating. Uh, Steve, why don't I go back to you? I'm curious to hear, um, the senators touch on this a little bit, but so much change in the economy during the pandemic. I mean, it's crazy, particularly with workforce. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone on this call has experience. We certainly have experience at the Washington Post that it's hard to hire right now. And um, you know, I'm wondering what you would say in terms of now being a moment that the country could really use this, um, this type of a change. What's the argument for how this could help the economic, the economy right now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a heck of an argument for it. To be able to move freely, uh, and and really spur innovation in our in our economy at this point when it's been a, a tough couple of years or three years as you'd admit uh, I just think that it would it's super important right now to have that freedom to be able to move around if 
someone so choose, chose to do so. Um, and I guess, uh, do you see any movement in, in your state on this issue? Does it ever come up when you're in business meetings with, with um, state level of executive leaders? I don't, I don't hear about it very often. And, and you know, we've, we've kind of put out as our company that we just don't honor non-competes. And, and, and so that's come up a lot in discussion that, uh, you know, if you want to sue us, go ahead and do that. No one's done that yet because it's not a practice that's very popular. Uh, people, they, they operate, you know, people have non-competes, they kind of operate in the shadows and, and they bully people. And, and so for us, we said, Hey, come and sue us if, if that's uh, if that's what you want to do. No one's done that. So just, I think that says another thing about non-competes in general, that uh, that they're so unpopular that people actually that have them uh, would not come out and sue us because we're so public about it and that we would post it on LinkedIn and uh, expose that lawsuit. Yeah, the role of power of the media and social it's, media here. Yeah, it's, it's a court of public opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, viewers are welcome to submit any questions for our panelists. I've got a ton more, but certainly would love to hear some from people who are tuning in. Um, Evan, I, I want to ask you another research question. Uh, one of the things that fascinates me when you and I talked about your research, um, one of the arguments that comes up a lot or somewhat in favor of keeping these non-compete agreements is that it would encourage companies to invest more in workers, more in training or in these sorts of things. Can you say what you found as you looked into that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's a, uh, the classic justification for non-compete agreements is that in order for uh, um, uh, me to protect some investment as a firm, you know, I, I don't want to subsidize my competition. So whether it's I'm providing you with a formula or some very super valuable training, I don't want to train my competitor. And so a non-compete agreement can help solve that problem and thus help uh, give the, the firm incentives to make those investments in the first place. That's the, that's the classic form of why non-competes could be potentially good. And so in some of my research, I've tried to, to suss out, um, you know, do we find evidence of, of those effects? And um, it is true that when you see non-compete agreements, you see um, more training for those workers. And where non-competes are more enforceable, you see more training. And I wanna highlight uh, uh, just one, one interesting uh, kind of point, which is that, you know, uh, our goal should actually not be to maximize investments. And let me just describe what I mean. If you're a firm operating in an industry uh, maybe like Peter in uh, the kind of tech world where everyone's got non-compete agreements, then training actually arises naturally. And it's not because you're giving your workers extra discretionary training. It's not like you're going to send them to those extra courses and then pay for them. It's that you can't hire anybody who has experience. You have to hire people out of school. You have to hire people from outside of the industry. And so what necessitates training is that you don't have access to the experienced labor pool who doesn't need it. You actually have to train. And so I, I urge some caution here in, in, in interpreting some of that evidence. And regardless of the, the training effects, you know, what we find is that workers nevertheless don't benefit from that training. Their wages are still lower. And in fact, if you look at, in one of our studies, we, we followed tech workers for eight years who just happened to start their careers in the highest enforcing state in the US, which is Florida. And if you just compare them uh, to what, what happens if they would have been in a state that doesn't enforce non-competes, their wages uh, cumulatively after eight years are still 5% lower, regardless of whether they left their firm or state. And so that, that tells you that like whatever training is happening, it's still not hitting the bottom line for the workers themselves. Wow, that's quite a finding. Yes, that even if there is more investment in workers happening, it's not really leading to more reward, at least financially. Um, Peter, I wanted you to weigh in again. I, did, have you ever been subject to one of these non-competes yourself in your career? And um, you know, you were talking a little bit about wanting to have this level playing field across the country. And, and one of the reasons you hope that there's some action federally or nationally at some level. And um, you know, I'm wondering, do you have you ever felt that your company was at a disadvantage by not using these? Well, I, I've not been subject to one. A lot of my working career has been California in California, so it, it wouldn't apply here. Um, and I'm sort of an opinionated person. I probably would not have gone to a company. I'm, I'm that type of person. I probably would not have gone to a company because I would have felt like, hey, that's that's not right. So I probably would have used that as a filter. Um, 
So now, as far as what we think about the government, I, I really, yeah, I think if the government can provide a level playing field and consistency and permanent, you know, consistency, that boy, that frees up commerce. That's what, that's what all business, business, you know, executives want. They just want consistency. And I'm, I'm really a fan of, I think that the, the uh, action at Congress would be, you know, more, more long lasting and, and more permanent, but I also applaud the F FTC. And just as a as a you know patriotic person, I'd love to see you know something where Democrats and and Republicans are are cooperating together. I said I think it sets a good example. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We have we had a good question from the audience on that that I'll also ask Steve and and Evan to weigh in on. Does it make any difference if there's this legislation that passes Congress versus doing it through the FTC process? Um, do you do you think that um, it makes it easier to enforce, or that there's one way that would be better for uh, for the nation here? Do you have any preference, Steve? And then I'm curious if Evan has any thoughts on this. I've heard that you know the FTC bans them, then it could get tied up in court, and if it goes through Congress, and it's uh, more enforceable, and, and it becomes law. So obviously, I think it, it both ways are great, uh, and and. So yeah, I, I, I'm worried about the FTC. I think um, the you know the, the Federal Trade Commission uh, going forward with this will be an interesting test of their authority, and um, I, I do think that whatever happens with it, the um, it'll probably be held up at least for a little bit. And I do think it's kind of raised the issue such that states at least are already moving forward with with some policies in the spirit of the FTC's approach, and I think it's only kind of galvanized the issue. So in some sense, I don't know if it's going to be the FTC or, or others who are, who are doing it, but everything seems to be kind of converging in that direction. If it comes from Congress, I think at least you have the benefit of uh, the argument that it, it's not unelected uh, technocrats who are choosing policy. Yeah, that seems to be consistent across the panel here, that preference for action, but slight preference for Congress to take the lead if possible. Um, you know, another good question that uh, comes up a lot and, and Evan has raised is that question of would this hurt small business? And uh, there's um, some great new, he flagged some great new research and polling from the small business majority group um, that suggests at least their members would also like to see some sort of action here to ban these non-competes. But I wondered, Peter or Steve, um, has, has this ever come up in your conversations? And what you hear from colleagues or from your own past experience, maybe when you were running smaller companies than what you are now? Well, I'll say, and, and Peter made this point earlier, like in logistics, the, a majority of the top 100 largest logistic uh, companies uh, have a non-compete. Uh, and they've been super stubborn uh, about coming off it. And we, we are now one of the top 100, but three years ago, we were a $33 million company uh, who wouldn't be in the top 2000 uh, logistics companies in the country. So there's there's kind of an answer to to the argument in both ways there. Yeah, I I remember Viva was a relatively small company and when you um you know and we started in 2007 and when you start you never kind of imagined it would become a big company you're just trying to survive. And then it started to grow a little bit and we were hiring different people and I ran into this non-compete issue where we where we couldn't hire some employee some employees uh, from other companies. And I, I called a CEO that was a friend of mine and I said, hey, well, I know you guys have non-competes and why do you have non-competes, right? Because I thought maybe there's something I was missing. And he said, well, we usually don't enforce them, but it, it kind of scares people and, and prevents them from leaving. So I thought, ooh, that sounds dirty. You know, that's, you know, that doesn't pass the sniff test of what's okay that you learn in kindergarten, right? shouldn't be scaring people and it's not okay. So then, you know, there's just a little example. Um, that's somebody who was actually a CEO that replied that way. Well, it scares people so they won't leave. It's not okay. And that's why government just has to take action. And then we just all move forward, make the U.S. a more productive place. Yeah, that's interesting. They sort of said the quiet part out loud, which uh, has come up over and over again on this webinar that you don't see a ton of let actual lawyers going after people over this. But well, you do. We defend probably about, oh, on the average, I guess it's about two or three lawsuits a year of company uh, people that come to Viva. They have non-competes and their companies 
decide to pursue it. Um, so we we do spend significant money on it. Um, but you're right, the majority just let it slide because they don't they won't they don't want to be named. But it still harms the employee uh, because they don't know if they're going to be sued or not. Wow, that's interesting, Peter. And you know, does that go at all into your thinking and your mindset as you're hiring? Obviously, you're looking for the best people, but if somebody's coming from I don't know a state that that does have these uh, allow these types of agreements, do you do you factor that in? We've made a public decision that we don't factor that in. It's the cost of business, and we'll defend anybody. But I can tell you that most companies don't, and they will shy away from the person that has a, a non-compete that will likely to be enforced or from a company that has a history enforced. So they'll shy away. And that's, I, I get it. I, I'm not making a judgment on that because people have businesses to run and they have to watch out for their own P and L, but gosh, what a shame that that person gets disadvantaged and, and they might not be considered for employment. It, it's wow. just not fair. It's not, it's not fair. Yeah. Yeah, that goes back to what Evan was sharing earlier with the MBA student he was speaking with. And sometimes you didn't even know you were signing this and that mul multitude of papers we all sign on the first day. Yeah. You know, uh, Evan, that, that MBA student, who knows, there could be an employer re reviewing their background and saying, no, I better pass on that person. It might get me into legal trouble. So they might not even be getting the interview request. Steve, I'm curious, uh, Peter sort of touched on it in his last answer, but um, has, has this, you know, as you mentioned, many companies in your industry do have these agreements. And do you, um, have you had any trouble with recruiting or do you feel it really changes the relationship you have with your employees versus what other companies in your industry can do? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, I've heard of so many situations because we've been so outspoken on LinkedIn about uh, our stance against non-compete. So a lot of people send me in mail and I, I hear of so many situations where a 24 year old quit their job and they went because they were offered double uh, the pay at another company because of their experience. They got to the other company and they found out they had non-compete. They lost that job. Uh, so now they're uh, out of the industry for two years, right? So that talent moves, uh, that talented person moves into another industry. They'll never come back to uh, logistics again, most likely because they'll start to flourish in another industry. Uh, and that's just wage suppression, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, and a, t a real talent suck out of our industry. Uh, and, and so we see that, we see that all too often. Evan, is there any um, evidence that you could share from your own research or from others' research that you've read around this notion of how employers relate to employees when, when they don't have these type of agreements, as, as some of our uh, viewers have been asking? Does it change that employee-employer relationship? You mean when they when they do have these agreements or when they don't have these agreements? I was thinking when they don't, but you're right. You can look at it yeah. either way, I suppose. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah. we've talked a little bit financially that having these in place can often hold back wages and certainly hold back ability yeah. of people to jump yeah. companies. But I'm wondering yeah. if there's any positive benefits that come the other way if you don't have it. Oh, well, if you don't have it, I mean, certainly then you're, you're, you know, so there's one study that's really interesting by, by Matt Johnson, Mike Lipsitz, and Kurt Levetti, which basically shows that workers with non-compete agreements or in states that enforce non-competes more vigorously are less able to take advantage of hot labor markets. So if you're a worker who doesn't have a non-compete and the labor market ticks up, maybe you get an outside offer that you can leverage for a raise, or maybe you, you just get a better offer. But workers with non-competes, are they're, they're stuck. They can't leverage that uh, offer from a competitor to get a raise. They can't take a better job offer. And so they're, you know, they're kind of stuck a little bit more. You know, the one thing I want to say on this, which, which is really interesting, is that when you talk to lawyers about non-competes, uh, lawyers, of course, are, are um, you know, they're going to submit comments to the Federal Trade Commission that are going to argue that the FTC's push is, is overbroad. But lawyers are actually the most interesting group to study because uh, as part of Model Rule 5.6 from the American Bar Association, lawyers have been prohibited from having non-compete agreements for, uh, since the 1960s. They're the only occupation in the whole US for which non-compete agreements have been prohibited. And they often change practices. They often take huge books of businesses uh, with them when they go, client relationships, et cetera. And yet they've figured out how to navigate a world without non-compete agreements. And if you ask them if they'd rather have non-competes, I, I, I would bet most of them uh, would not like to have non-compete agreements. 
And what's interesting, I think, is that the way that the lawyers actually, the American Bar Association justified their, their prohibition on lawyer non-competes, the argument is that it hurts clients because if your lawyer is forced to sit out of the market, then the client can't choose their attorney. And I think that's actually, when you get to the level of executives and others, that's really the argument the FTC is making, that a non-compete agreement is really not only about the two parties who are signing it, but it also affects Steve if he can't hire you or Peter if they can't hire you. It affects the consumers who may not benefit from the products that you would create if you're going to go start a new company. And I think that's the broader perspective that we need to think about with regards to, the, to society and the markets and get away from just thinking about you know, whether a single contract between two parties is, uh, is legitimate or not. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that. It's interesting. So at the Washington Post on the editorial board, uh, we came out in favor of, of the FTC maybe um, doing this, but putting some sort of threshold, like $100,000, basically, similar to the Washington state model. And we heard from a lot of doctors, too, who would be <laughs> in a similar boat to what you're describing as the lawyers. Um, Peter, we've got a good question in uh, from the audience on the tech side that I wanted to um, throw back to you. And you know, this person says, hey, I, I broadly am in favor of getting rid of these non-compete agreements, but do we run any risk, particularly in the tech side, of starting to see other, um, un is there a risk of unreasonable trade secret or other IP laws being implemented here, you know, as, as, as executives in this sector maybe get antsy and worried that without non-competes, they would have to really legal up on these other agreements. No, I, I don't think so. Um, and again, you can look at California as a, as a use case for, for decades here. So I really don't think so. Um, you know, non-confidentiality uh, agreements is a very well-known practice. Um, it's enforceable, it, it's serious, and there's also patent and trade secret protection. So I, I just really don't think so. I think non-competes, they're to suppress competition. It's right, it's right there in the name. Confidentiality agreement, that's how you handle trade secrets and, and other confidential information. Um, we've had a pretty broad ranging discussion here. I guess just to wrap it up, um, you know, I'm curious to hear what you all would advise. Many of you have been very outspoken, at least Steve and Peter in your own respective circles, whether it's on LinkedIn or me, Peter's done some Medium posts. Um, you know, have you had any, any negative feedback from what you're doing or what your advice would be to others who want to see advocacy um, and, and see these agreements go away? Any, any thoughts from your experience, Steve? Well, it's been absolutely incredible. When you, you, know, you know how it is on uh, any social media, you, 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 catch, uh, you catch things sometimes that are negative, but I have, I have never seen a comment on anything that I've put out there. And, and it gets a ton of, uh, a, a ton of play on LinkedIn. Nobody likes it. Customers don't like it. I've had so many customers tell me that. Uh, our, you know, our carrier community, our vendors, uh, candidates. I mean, just nobody likes it. Nobody wants to be seen as the company that's enforcing it. Uh, so I just, I see very little negativity around uh, or, or, you know, the other side of the, the fence where they would like to keep them. It's just, I've almost never heard it. And do you see any encouraging signs in your industry of other companies starting to follow your example or, or at least opening their door minds to it? Yeah, we have, we have a website called nnoncompetes.com. We've had it running for almost two years or a year and a half. We have a hundred and I think it's 140 companies that have signed up uh, to take the pledge to to not have a non-compete. Uh, and so, yeah, we've we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of support around it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I'm curious your uh, your take. You've written some pretty uh, pretty forceful arguments for this. Yeah. I think there's a lot of benefits in the feeling of your employees. Uh, I think it, it is a one contributor to create more engaged em employees. Um, you know, you give trust to get trust. So when the when the company gives that trust, you can get you can you will get the trust back, and you you have a right to ask for that trust back. So I think that's the biggest positive. There could be a negative. We're a business to business company. We we sell our products to other businesses. So if you if you have executives in, in, in your customers that maybe they don't feel that right way, right? Maybe they feel that they want to keep their non-compete. So maybe that causes them to have a little, little agita with Viva. So that's a potential uh, downside. 
And there, you know, for that downside, that's why I would really advocate for government action, because then it just levels the playing field. Everybody knows how to operate and there's no more agenda around this issue. And is anything that gives you hope that momentum is shifting here on, on this issue? Well, I think it's the government action, right? If you would have asked me, and I, I don't know about Steve, but if you would have asked me three years ago, hey, do you think there's going to be action in Congress and the FTC on this? I would have said, well, you know, it would probably take longer than that. So as part of being a public benefit corporation, we set out a goal to help end non-competes in the U.S. by the year 2030. So I'm just, it's the government action, I think, is raising the awareness. I think it's outstanding. And there has been some pushback from some in the business community. Um, you, I, that's probably not surprising to you. I'm sure you've heard a lot of it, uh, both publicly and privately. Um, you know, any final words on, on what you would sort of say to some of those who, who are still clinging to wanting to have these in place? Well, I, I would say, you know, it's honestly okay. I'm not here to pass judgment. I just want to provide an example that uh, not having non-competes has worked very well for Viva and is, um, has given more energy to Viva, and I feel good about it. So I, I think it, it's okay if you want to take the plunge. It's okay, but I understand if, you, if you're not ready. And Evan, uh, last word to you, uh, as you've given us so many good insights and, and facts to ground this discussion in. I, I'm just wondering if you could summarize what you think the biggest benefits would be to, to getting rid of these across the country in the United States. I think, um, if, you know, the research suggests that, you know, a non-compete agreements hold back workers from taking better jobs, from, uh, from, you know, increasing their earnings, from starting new jobs. It suggests that uh, even innovation is lower where non-competes are more enforceable. And so my sense is that uh, moving forward with this sort of thing, that the companies, you know, they may not want to lose their workers, but this will be a great opportunity for them to think about the areas they do want to grow. Which, which workers, you know, would you have hired if you could have hired everybody? I mean, part of the, the small business uh, survey that you mentioned earlier was that 36% of the small business owners had struggled to hire because of a non-compete agreement, right? And so I think while it may be, true that businesses are nervous about losing people and potentially losing some information, think about the potential upsides about who you could bring in, where your business could go if it could hire freely. And I, I hope that businesses begin to, to take that perspective because I do think that these agreements are gonna to continue to be restricted, if not soon, uh, then, then not long after that. Thank you so much to a great discussion from Peter and Steve and Evan. And I encourage people to check out your, your work on this, your writings, your websites, your research uh, in noncompetes.com from Steve. That makes it pretty clear where, where we stand. Uh, and thank you again to the Economic Innovation Group for really not just hosting this webinar today, but for keeping this issue and the spotlight in Washington, D.C. and across the country. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.